There's nothing better we can do with our life than try to understand more clearly what God has to say to us, and as a product of that, or as a result of that, become more obedient to the Word of God. Uh, let's go now to our where we were last time. We were looking at Hebrews chapter 6, and in chapter 6, where we came to, we saw there, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. And uh, he is giving a list of six uh, six basic doctrines that are that should be understood as first principles of the whole Christian gospel, and we're beginning to go through those. Uh, and uh, and but then you are to aspire to go on from there. You don't stay there. You keep looking, digging into that mind for more nuggets, more and more nuggets of truth. Then he goes on to the laying on of hands. Now, the laying on of hands, of course, is again a doctrine that is very much misunderstood. And yet, we know, if we go back to uh, Acts 8, back to Acts 8, we find uh, a number of incidents where we see hands laid on. And, uh, and we know it has to do with the fact of people becoming believers because they have heard the true gospel. We read in Acts 8 in about the, the Samaritans and uh, 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 Peter and John have come down to meet with them. And verse 15, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Now, bear in mind, unless we have the Holy Ghost, we're not saved. Romans 8 verse 9 teaches that emphatically. If we do not have the Spirit, we're none of His. So to receive the Holy Ghost is tantamount to saying, you do become saved. It is the moment that we receive our glorified spiritual, uh, excuse me, we receive our, our brand new resurrected soul and eternal life. And that is the action of the Holy Spirit applying the Word of God to our lives. But God used a figure. Again, notice the idea of parable parable, a metaphor, because he's, God is not teaching that we have to physically, physically lay hands on each one who becomes a believer. We know that that can't be possible. Uh, it's, uh, it, uh, it, uh, there are people who, throughout the church age who hear the gospel. Uh, maybe they, a gospel tract got, got their way, or maybe they heard a a missionary come through town that one night and and they heard the gospel and and uh, two weeks later God applied that word to their heart as they became interested in the word of God nobody physically laid hands on them but God is using that as a figure of the Holy Spirit being applied we read in verse 16 for as yet the Holy Ghost had not fallen upon any of them only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus they had a had the sign put on them but that didn't get them saved the sign was was uh, just water baptism that has no substance then laid they, they then laid they their hands on them and they received the holy ghost and so god is using the figure of laying on of hands to indicate salvation now uh, in this figure uh, it is the apostles who are laying hands on these uh, because they, at this point, are the ones who are bringing the gospel. They are the custodian of the gospel. Now, they themselves didn't get these people saved. God the Holy Spirit did the saving, but God uh, uh, is, uh, is including us as we bring the gospel uh, into the act uh, 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 simply because uh, this is his... Uh, a divine economy that we are to share the gospel and as the gospel is there because we have brought it there and God has instigated all of this of course but because we brought it there therefore the Holy Spirit applies it to the heart of the one God wants to save and so it's like we have laid our hands on them we have we it is our will to lay hands on is to put somebody in our will it is our desire it is our will that these people might become Say, we see the same thing in an interesting way in Acts 13. In Acts 13, where they are sending out the first missionaries, 
and from the church in Antioch, and uh, the, and we read in Acts 13, uh, verse uh, uh, two, and as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, "Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them." And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Now, both fasting and laying on of hands, while, are, uh, while they were done physically at this point, are in actuality a, a historical parable or metaphor, in that the fasting represents that they were going forth to send forth the gospel. Remember, Isaiah 58 teaches, this is the fast that I choose, that you loose the bonds of the wicked and, and uh, set the prisoners free and feed the hungry and so on. That all has to, that again is metaphorical language. You know, we keep running into that every place we turn. But that's the way God wrote the Bible. So that those who are uh, not elect will not understand. They'll remain in their blindness. But we who are true believers, we understand this. We don't have a problem with this at all. And so both the fasting and the laying on of hands simply means that it is the Holy Spirit's purpose that we go out with the gospel. Uh, and uh, and uh, it is the Holy Spirit that will apply that word in turn to the lives of others who hear the gospel. This is the reason, for example, in Second Timothy chapter 1. In Second Timothy chapter 1, we read about Paul speaking to his young protege under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Timothy. Uh, and so he says there in verse 6 of Second Timothy chapter 1, Wherefore... I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. And that can be a gift uh, uh, like the gift that was received when, he, when the Samaritans were saved, that, uh, that uh, uh, the apostles laid their hands on them. That is, uh, the Holy Spirit has imparted, been imparted to you, Timothy, uh, and now... Uh, you are a child of God, and now you stir up that gift because God has qualified you in many ways to be a preacher. He's qualified you to, uh, to work full-time in the gospel ministry, and now go forth and, and stir that gift up. Be diligent. Be with it. Don't uh, be re reluctant. Don't be lazy. Don't, uh, don't slough it off. Get busy, Timothy. You've got the gifts. Uh, you've been given the gift of, of the Holy Spirit. You've been given, uh, that is, you've been given salvation. Now go forth. All right. Well, anyway, that's, that's a fundamental doctrine, that it is the Holy Spirit who has to save us, and, uh, and uh, that in turn, as he has saved us, we are qualified and mandated and commissioned by the Holy Spirit to send the gospel out into the world. The next, the next fundamental principle, resurrection of the dead, resurrection of the dead. Isn't it amazing that although the Bible has given us John 3, where God speaks to uh, Nicodemus through the, or the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to Nicodemus and he's saying very plainly you have to be born again you have to be born again so plainly that what was Nicodemus's answer you mean I have to enter my mother's womb and be born a second time in other words he didn't he understood you have to have a new birth you have to be like a new person a totally new person Jesus uh, uh, is, is there is emphasizing that and he's indicating how this will happen in verse 5 he says so you have to be born of water and the spirit and we know that the water represents the kingdom of God again notice the metaphorical language and the Holy Spirit that's not metaphorical that is a directly it is the Holy Spirit that has to apply the Word of God to our life and thus you are born again uh, you're born of the Spirit. Well, that is, well, how can that be? How can that be? Well, then we, uh, what the church should have been doing, should have been doing through its years as it has been uh, dealing with these fundamental principles, is searching this out. What does all of that really mean? 
And if you go into the various denominations again today, you get a whole plethora of answers that, that, uh, that, uh, that show that they don't really understand. Yet this is part of the first principles. So God is really saying you should have been able to understand this a lot better than you do understand it. But because you're not continuing to, to search the Bible, you're not continuing to, to fine-tune what you think you know. You're not continuing to correct your confessions and correct your church dogmas. Uh, you, are, uh, you are not moving at all. You're like a baby that is not growing. Well, the fact is, uh, if they had kept studying, they would know, well, yes, it's true. Before we're saved, we're spiritually dead. We're dead. We're as dead as Lazarus. It amazed me. It amazed me. Uh, some a uh, couple of years ago, I was reading a very, very uh, a, a theological uh, uh, book by a seminary professor who I believe was a true child of God. I have no reason not to believe he was not. He's a older than I. He's probably 20 years older uh, and uh, very uh, conservative, very much accepted as somebody who was very trustworthy in the Bible. Yet, when he wrote a, a, a concordance, or a commentary, rather, on the Gospel of John. And when he came to John 11, he hadn't the slightest clue that that was a picture of salvation when God raised Lazarus from the dead. That God was teaching the whole, the whole nature of salvation. He missed that entirely. I just, I, I shook my head in amazement. How can you miss that? It is so obvious when Christ said, I am the resurrection uh, and the life, right at the time he's standing at the tomb of Lazarus. But because they're not going beyond the milk of the word, they're not, they're, they're not continuing to ask questions and pray for wisdom and come humbly there. They're trusting in their theologians of the past. They're trusting in their catechism. They're trusting in their confessions. They're trusting in their articles of faith. Whatever, whatever their denomination holds. And so they're not going beyond it. first principles. And then eternal judgment. Again, there's so much misunderstanding between the denominations on eternal judgment. There are those who teach and again, there are people that ought to know better. They really ought to know better, I would think. And yet they're teaching that every believer has to stand before the judgment throne. Every believer has to stand before the judgment throne. Oh, they won't come under condemnation because when, uh, when God looks at them, they're going to, uh, but they are going to be shamed because God is going to flash before their eyes every sin they've ever committed and, uh, and uh, uh, they're going to be totally ashamed of that and then the Lord Jesus is saying but I, will, I have forgiven you I have forgiven you and so they're going to go with rejoicing into heaven now where in the world do you read that in the Bible? and yet this is held by very precise, prestigious denominations this kind of a doctrine uh, even eternal judgment is uh, is emasculated it's not understood at all and certainly there's been no understanding of uh, the fact that judgment would begin with the house of God that but that that's end time and uh, we can understand why that the Lord hadn't opened anybody's eyes to that but what, what, what God is teaching here, that God had an expectation that down through the era of the church age, there should have been, and it was not contrary to God's timetable, that there should have been a little bit more understanding of some of these fundamental doctrines and some of the other things in the Bible that, that are not even included here. But... Uh, uh, in verse 3 tells us, of course, that God has a timetable. And this is something that we can't intrude upon. We can't dictate to God that they should have known this much or that much at a certain time in history. We, we, uh, that, that's God's business, how much finally anybody could have known. 
We do know that God has allowed the churches to function throughout the New Testament era in spite of their weaknesses, ter terrible weaknesses, in spite of the fact that a great many people in those congregations did not grow in grace. Uh, God has allowed them to go on and on and on. And, and uh, whenever anyone has come to truth, we know that it is only in God's timetable. Here God is clearly insisting, this we will do if God permit. Now, this is not saying that we lean back on our theological throne and, uh, and, and in our ivory castle and say, well, we have already know this and this and this and this. We've wrote this, written this confession, and we hold this in our denomination, and now we're going to wait until God somehow instructs us to search some more. Uh, how is he going to instruct us? Well, we're not going to wait for a vision because we know that God is not going to bring any more uh, to the, any more written revelation to us. It's uh, the the book is closed. The uh, it's completed. There's no more that can be added. So how do we know that uh, that it's time that God is going to teach us more by continuing to search the Word, continuing to search the Word. And as you search the word every now and then and you're praying for truth, you read a sentence and and you say, oh, now I understand that. I haven't understood that before. Hmm. Yeah. And then you check that against everything else, you know, and you find that it fits. Oh, thank you, Lord. I know just a little tiny bit more. Now, as we approach the end, of course, this expansion of knowledge is, uh, is, uh, is going uh, very, very fast. I still remember 40 years ago when I finally came to the understanding of the calendars of the Bible. Wow, wow, how can it be that, this has, that we know about this now? For all through the church age, people have wondered, when did Adam, when was Adam created? But here it is. You work through the Bible. You can uh, lay it all out in black and white and it all figures, and you get to 11,013 B.C. When we, when we make that agree with our Roman calendar or the calendar that we have today. And the flood was 4990 B.C., and, and Abraham's day was uh, he entered the land of Canaan in the year 2092 B.C., and so on and so on. Suddenly, God has given us that information. Suddenly. And it's a wonderful blessing. But how did it come? Well, it comes because we search the Word, search the Word, and pray for wisdom, and search the Word. And... Uh, of course, at times it's very frustrating. A lot of times you work on a verse, you work on a verse, my, you look at it uh, uh, 50 times, 100 times, and you keep, keep looking at it. I know this is an important, an important verse, but I don't understand it. Oh, Lord, where's truth? And then maybe years later, you're reading something else in another part of the Bible, and you remember, yeah. That ties in with that passage I was struggling with a, a few years ago or a few months ago. Oh, that's the clue. And the next thing you have another piece of truth. This is what the, what the theologians should have been doing all the time. I, I think about the seminaries. We have, there have been prestigious seminaries that are particularly scattered in our land, although they've been in England and other countries also, Germany and so on, and yet they never got beyond the doctrines that the Reformers put together back there 400 years ago. And I think, what's going on? Why? After all, theology means the study of God. And what is the study book of God? The Bible. And so if we're going to learn theology, we're not going to read each other what we're saying. We're going to read the Bible and read the Bible and read the Bible. And God has promised that it's the Holy Spirit will lead into truth. So if I'm going to be a theologian, it means I have declared myself 
I'm going to study, 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 study the Bible. And there's no let up. I'm going to study. And God uh, implies in these statements there will be a growth. That baby has to grow. There has to be, it may not grow as fast as we would like, but there's going to be growth. We're going to get into stronger and stronger meat. Even when we get one of these basic doctrines straightened out, so that we really now understand what baptism is, really understand what the resurrection from the dead is. We've already grown a whole lot if we really have a true biblical understanding of that rather than just a denominational understanding which is differing from differing from all the other denominations then we, and but when we really have come so that we can look at any verse in the bible that speaks about the resurrection from the dead or uh, any of these other fundamental truths we can say i can explain that i can explain that because i we, we've done our homework in this and we uh, we understand what god is teaching so we see here therefore that there is a timetable and because we're at that time uh, right near the end now we have the explosion of knowledge now we're finding uh, we're learning about the end of the church age, the latter reign, and the great tribulation, and and uh, and uh, how uh, what was the problem in the churches all through the church age that they are what they are, and so on and so on. We're just learning all kinds of things because we're at that time. But if we don't understand and trust in progressive revelation. And if we are not understanding that Christ spoke in parables, we're dead in the water. We're absolutely dead in the water. We're not going to understand anything more. We're going to shake our head in, in uh, unbelief, and, uh, and that's where we're going to stay. We're not going to move from that. And as a matter of fact, uh, when, we, when we were going through the parable of the wheat and tares, we learned that God was teaching that he would bind them. He would blind further. He would send a strong delusion so that those who remain there get even more convicted that there is no, uh, no progressive revelation. Even more convicted that that uh, we're, we can't work through these uh, spiritual ideas. We, we just have to look at it in the plain language of today, and otherwise we, we, uh, we uh, uh, are not going to find truth. And so they remain in their unbelief. Now next time we're going to go on and begin with verse 4. Verse 4. And we're going to look at this in... Uh, some detail and with great, very great care because it's talking about those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come and having fallen away remember we've learned in verse 6 the next phrase if they shall fall away it's in the original Greek it simply says and having fallen away and, uh, and we have to go into that in some detail. How can these churches that have uh, been enlightened, have ha tasted the heavenly gift and so on, how can they fall away? And yet we know that this is what is happening. And we already got a dramatic picture of that when we looked at uh, uh, Revelation chapter 2 at the church at Ephesus that it was on the path of, of uh, beginning to come under the wrath of God. The candlestick was going to be removed because they had departed from the, uh, first, their first love. And we saw it when we looked at the church at Sardis, that it had become a dead church. But in our next study, we will begin to develop this with some care and some detail. And in the meanwhile, between now and next time, we want to continue to read the Bible, read the Bible. I can't say that often enough because that's where it all is. That is the supreme law book that God has given us. It's all there. It's all there. We just have to get busy and start reading it more carefully.